So today we're going to be um, talking about how we define spouses. And I wanted to make sure that we went in with the frame of mind and Jay's kind of set the stage already, but just going in with the mindset of that we should be rejecting the patterns of the world and what the world says things are and the way that we should be or see things, but be looking at things through what God says and how God defines things, how God um, guides us and recommends and instructs us. So as we're going through this presentation, I'm going to be posing some questions. These are not questions for people to answer verbally responding. I want you to be introspective in asking these questions of yourself um, as far as what you think and how you feel and what you believe God is telling you in response to those, those ideas that you have and what um, and, and hearing from him. And the reason that I don't want you to verbally respond is because we have a different dialogue when it's outward versus what's inward. And I don't want you to answer considering the audience or everybody else that's that's um, on the call, but really communing with God and what he's telling you and what he's guiding you to see in what's being shared. OK. All right. All right, Jay, you're you're uh, the, the man of the house of CSC. So I'm going to ask you to pray uh, for uh, us today. Okay, no problem, no problem. <clears throat> Lord God, we just thank you and we give you praise, Father. We just thank you for um, just allowing us to come together this morning. Um, we know, Lord God, that uh, you have been moving strongly among CSC, Lord God, and just you are turning this uh, group, Lord God, towards your face and what you desire for us to be. So we ask, Lord God, that you would just touch us, guide us, lead us, protect us in this day, but that you would um, just move and have your way, Lord God, that we would hear your voice today very clear, Lord God, in our spirits, Lord God, what we need to do um, in order to please you, but also to find wonderful spouses, um, to have wonderful relationships, and to uh, bring our, us and ourselves, Lord God, into everything that you would desire for us. So I just ask, Lord God, that each and every last person be patient, that they be open, um, that they're ready to receive your good and wonderful word. And we just thank you, honor you, and give you praise for your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. All right. So you do not have to have these things, but this is what you may find helpful during this uh, presentation. And as always, we're going to talk afterwards. Um, but uh, you're going you you may find it useful to have your Bible or or your app if you use the app for scripture, because there are there's a lot of scripture in this presentation. Um, pencil, pen, piece of paper. And if you do have, as I mentioned in the comments about the presentation, um, if you have a list of uh, preferences or desires, or if you have a, a, something that you pray over or have that you um, speak to God on as far as your uh, spouse or partner, um, then you that would be helpful for you to have with you as well. <laughs> All right, so we've talked about this before, this top five or however long your list might be, but we, we, try, we talk about having just uh, five key things that um, you want to have in mind as far as what your uh, life partner traits would be or what they, what they would have that would be um, the core things that would make a good match for you with this person. Um, I listed the ones that I hear most often and, and uh, I did it gender neutral. Um, that, so the uh, of men and women, these are the things that are most often stated, uh, either being Christian or being spiritual or having some type of relationship with God, being loving and respectful, honest and, and independent. Um, now, I'm not going to get into too much the fact that some of these things mean different things to different people, because sometimes being loving for some people means be, being showered with gifts. For some, it means being very affectionate. Um, it's just it depends on the person what these things actually mean. So um, they, they're somewhat general 
in my mind in stating this. Same thing with relationship with God. Some people think it's going to church um, two, three times a week. Some people think it's just being prayerful. So it's something that you have to define for yourself and understand that different people have different meanings for that. So keeping in mind whether you have it written or it's just something that you know in within yourself what your desire is as far as a partner is concerned, what uh, their traits would be. Um, you have to make sure that the deal breakers are front of mind because we always think about, oh, these are things I would really like, but those things that you can't tolerate, either them not having or those things that you um, can't deal with, like, oh, I just can't deal with the person who um, is always um, going out all the time. It bothers me when they, they want to go out every weekend. Um, it, I want to stay home and, and relax. I had a hard week. So if, there's th if there are things that you know you can't tolerate, um, not having or you can't tolerate dealing with as a trait, you want to be mindful of those things as well. Those are also important because they can over time erode the benefits of the things that they do have that you do want. So keeping in mind those things, you develop or part of what we try to do in uh, coming together is have a plan on how you're going to move forward with finding or being prepared for um, this person that God is going to bring or that's going to cross your path or that you're going to meet. And again, generalizing, we I put together this list of, okay, um, we in this group try to examine our experiences, learn from our mistakes and understand ourselves better and um, trust that God is gonna send the right person, whether it be in our seeking or in our preparedness. Um, so this is a general plan, but do you have a plan? Have you thought about what your part is in or what your responsibility or role is in being in the situation of making sure when God sends the person, will you be ready? Do you have a strategy or are you just praying and waiting? So what we know is um, what we have read in Matthew 7, 16 through 20. And I'm not, there's a lot of scriptures. I'm not going to read all of them. I'm going to read this one because it kind of sets the stage. Um, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. So with this in mind, what traits would attract this type of person to you? You know what you want, but what's going to, just as you're looking at what's going to be attractive to you, what's going to make them attracted to you in return? How would they identify those traits in you? If you were to say, okay, I know, that these are the things that I want. And this is how I'm going to know that they possess those traits. How are they in turn going to know that you possess the traits that would be attractive to them in turn? What behaviors, habits signify these traits? Because that's the fruit, right? That's what shows that you possess the traits is what you're doing just as that's how you're identifying it in them, what they're doing is showing whether or not they are 
exemplifying those things that you're looking for. And so therefore, how do you exhibit these traits in your everyday life? And you looking at your life right now today, if that person crossed your path and you said, oh yes, this is exactly God sent this person. I know this is the one. I see all the things that I was looking for. Is that person going to look at you and see the same thing? How will they know it's you? The same way that you are saying, okay, God, tell me, let me know. How are they going to know? So let's talk about the traits. Now, this was a very interesting experience for me in preparing for this because what I found was for men, there was pieces all over the place <laughs> of what a, a husband, um, exemplary husband's traits would be. And um, before I even get to it, everybody knows that Proverbs 31, it kind of is a synopsis or a summary. So it was like really easy. I found more than that, but that it was like, oh, bam, one scripture. But with the husbands, yeah, it was uh, a lot of pieces spread around. So the main ones I, I listed here, Ephesians, Colossians, 1 Timothy, 1 Peter. Um, but I, I summarized what came out of the scripture of a husband that's worthy to lead. And I intentionally titled it that way because that is part of what scripture says is that a husband is the lead or the head of the home of the family. And so therefore, right off the bat, they're a provider. They need to be disciplined, faithful, respectful. All of these things exemplify a leader and a husband and a leader are synonymous. Okay. And the scriptures that I have listed on everything is where I'm pulling this from so that you guys can check me. <laughs> you don't have to take my word for it. And, um, and uh, you can take a picture or you can watch it later when we you know, put up the recording if you can't um, look at it all right now, because I know some of them are a lot. But the key things here are, as a man, looking at this list, are you seeing these traits? portrayed in your life that if the woman that you're praying that God brings will see these things in you by the habits, by the characteristics that you portray in the choices you make in your life. As a woman, same thing. Now, like I said, this was, this was easier. The, the list is technically longer for men, but like I said, it's scattered about. So some of the things were generalized. So we have a few more things to talk about as far as traits, but the things that were specifically directed to men or women, I tried to encompass in these two slides or these two lists. So all of these things came from Proverbs 31 and 1 Peter. And um, what I thought was interesting about some of the things that were included was uh, there was one particular part of Proverbs in which it said that the, um, the woman or the wife would find a, a land and she would acquire it of her own means, not her husband's money. <laughs> so um, that was interesting to me that she was self-sufficient, even though she's a part of a household, she's um, under his covering, that she is resourceful and self-sufficient in her own right. So not somebody that's, I need to find somebody to take care of me or some of the other things that we've heard people say on occasion. Um, mm -hmm. I did want to call out one thing that comes up all the time. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, this thing about submitted. Now I put the word submitted on purpose because that is what aligns with the scripture. 
not submissive, submitted. So now what's the difference between submitted and submissive? When you're submitted, you accept or yield to a superior force or to an authority or the will of another person. Now, if you're covered by your husband, um, just as God covers us, that is not in difference to your needs or your desires as a wife or a woman. That's in consideration of that because a good leader considers and listens to their followers. Submissive is acceptance or yielding to a superior force or authority of a will another person in that you're just, it's like you're just, um, you're just, you're just letting go. When you're, um, when you're doing, when you're submitting for when you're submitting, you're accepting that, okay, this person's covering me. I accept that they, they um, will consider me. They'll do what's needed to be done. And uh, when you're looking at um, submitting, I'm sorry, submissive, it's just kind of giving up. So submitting, you have power and you're yielding that power. Submissive is just it's a sense of basically that you are powerless. And when you are a good wife, as it says in the list, you're um, not powerless. You're using your power for the good of the whole, of the family, of, of um, what is the direction that your husband and you agree to move forward with. It's the strength and the power combined, but you're not divided where you have separate wills, separate desires, separate interests. You're coming together, understanding that there's a choice and a direction and the power that you have is going to propel and support the husband's leadership. Oh, I hope that makes sense. Um, and anybody that's sitting there thinking that I, uh, said the same thing, I apologize. I did, uh, somehow get the, um, definitions cause I looked, I looked up the definitions. Um, yeah. Okay. So submissive is meekly obedient or passive. My cut and paste, uh, went wrong there. So submissive is meekly obedient or passive. And uh, submitted is accepting or yielding to authority. So um, as, as a wife and as a woman, in being submitted, it's, it's similar to being committed, but it has power involved in that your power is not relinquished. You're not letting go of it and saying, you know, I'm powerless. I just got to do whatever. You're joining your power to the authority that's in your life of God. And then when you're married to your husband to say, okay, we are going to further this choice, this agenda, this, um, this uh, need that the family has, and I'm going to do my part and use my power for what the lead or what the authority is saying is the right direction for us to go. Okay. So as I said, this is a little bit longer list, but we have some more um, that is more generalized for men and women. All right, so I wanted to start with, with uh, virtue because um, this is something that I think is difficult for, for singles because of the world because of the situations we're in because of music because of movies different things that pull us towards um impurity impure you may have noticed was on both lists so in ephesians and in first corinthians it talks about not just not doing sexually immoral things, but not even talking about them, not joking about them, not giving place to it in your life in general, not, not speaking life into those things. 
whether it's internally or amongst others. So you want to consider what is it that I'm saying or doing, especially if you're thinking about in the, in the, uh, what we're speaking of today, when you're talking about when you're meeting someone. So you meet somebody and you're getting to know them, they're getting to know you. And the innuendo, the jokes, the um, little asides, what is that communicating to that other person about what your virtue is? Now, sometimes we don't feel like it's that serious. Like, you know, it's just a little joke. It's just, you know, uh, just to break the ice, just to make things more comfortable. Make I don't want them to think that I'm, you know, stuffy or what have you. But if you find that it opens the door to other conversations, was it because it started there? Consider what you're communicating and what you're giving audience to in the conversation. And when it's friends, when it's just, you know, people that are not necessarily dating or anything like that, are you helping or are you hurting their path to remaining pure? Because we, we know that we're supposed to guard our hearts. We're supposed to guard what we say, what we you know, think, what we do. And so what's conceived in your mind and your heart that you speak, that affects you. It can't help but affect you. And so as you're changing what you're saying, you're changing your thoughts because they start as thoughts and then they form into words. And if you're adjusting your mind to not think or ponder on clever things that are straddling the line or what have you, not concerning yourself with what others think, but concerning yourself with what God is saying is appropriate, then you will begin that process that we said in, showed in the first uh, slide, the renewing of your mind, not being conformed to the patterns of the world, of the obscenity and, and um, speaking of things. And it's not a matter of judgment or indictment of any person. This is truly about you being able to be in circumstances and situations that are not what you know are not of God and being able to withstand and withhold yourself regardless of the circumstances. Because you'll go to parties, you'll go to, to situations, you'll be on a date with someone who will say things that you don't feel are appropriate. And if you are having this standard for yourself that is not in any way connected to the world, but to what God says, then that person's going to know I can't do that with this person and they, God will deal with them. As Jay was just saying earlier about praying for us, when we have our standard, then others determine that, oh, okay, what, what do I, what does that say about me? What does that say about what I'm doing? Is there a problem with what I'm doing? But if everybody's doing it, then nobody feels convicted in their spirit because it's okay, because it's like everyone is a safe place to do that. But when we open ourselves up to things, that opens the door for things that are not good for us to come in. So this is something that you have to practice on a regular basis because it's coming from all sides just about all media, I mean, even just network television has profanity and sexual promiscuity and all kinds of different things that are constantly flooding into our, um, our sensibilities. And so you have to, just as it's consistently coming in, you have to consistently push back and cleanse yourself of those things and guard yourself. So uh, 1 Corinthians, the primary message in here that I pulled out for us to talk about is grace. And, um, and the reason why I, uh, I said grace is because all of these things are necessary to give not just others room to be clay 
on, on God's pot or a will um, to be molded, but, but also for ourselves. Um, having compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, all these things are necessary to be able to have healthy relationships with ourselves, with other people. And that's with, you know, a per- perspective significant other, that's with our brothers and sisters, um, whether they are believers or not. God doesn't say, um, love thy neighbor as long as they believe what you believe. It's love thy neighbor, period. And so as we make mistakes, as we make poor choices, as we make good ones, as others do both, the good choices and the bad, we have to come with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Um, We want people to be considerate of us. We want them to be kind with us. We want them to be patient with us and we need to do the same. We want to be forgiven. We need to forgive ourselves and we need to forgive others. Um, love is a, a word that we use in a lot of different situations that again, what does it look like and showing compassion, showing all these traits that are in the first bullet is showing love. It's not that it's easy. It is very difficult. Um, the older we get, <laughs> the more we know it's, it's very difficult to do. So it's worded as if it's very simple and it's so nice and it's beautiful, but in practice, it is hard. But that's why our relationship with God is so essential and being in prayer is so essential because there are times where we're going to be required or we have been required to say and do things that we know is not the choice we would have made, but God. And God will give us the strength and the direction to carry ourselves in that manner in situations that we would like to just reach back and uh, revert to some other choices we would have made. Um, but it would not serve the greater good. It would not serve God's will for us or for that person. So we have to uh, show grace and, um, and show love by being all of these things. So when you're, again, thinking about how you conduct yourself in your everyday life, that, that man or that woman that God is bringing or has brought perhaps, they may already know you. Are you showing these things that they can say, that's God. I know that God is in their life. I know that they um, have a relationship because of how they handled that situation, because of how they they spoke to me, um, because of how they walk in love or in their uh authority of what God has put on their life. So uh, Ephesians, this one um, I pulled out sewing because this particular um, scripture speaks a lot about um, the growth and destruction of things. So dishonesty animosity, subversion, all these things are um, destructive actions and they put you at odds with God's commandment to love one another. They destroy relationships with not just with the person that you are perhaps deceiving or taking from, but also your relationship with yourself because you carry your actions and your choices with you. You are the person that did these things. And it also hurts the relationship you have with God. So 
even if you can get away with it, even if nobody's going to know, walk in truth, walk in honesty, build up others, don't take from them and undermine their foundation or, or what they have built, but add to. And, um, and so that is the sewing, sewing truth in yourself, in your relationships, in your growth, and development in God, letting go of anger or destructive feelings that don't grow and develop that positivity within yourself or in life. And as you practice that, those things show up in your actions and in your choices. Those are things that whatever you do, it become, as it becomes a habit, as it becomes a practice, as it shows up in, in, your, in the things that you're basically your fruit, those are showing what type of person you are. Um, as I said, because it's not easy, it's something that you have to practice and you're not always going to get it right. It's not always going to be perfect. We're, that we, we need God to be more perfect every day. But because we are seeking to do something difficult and we do need God for that automatically to seek God to be exemplifying these things, making these choices is going to build our relationship with him because we have to lean on him more and more. We have to talk to him more and more. And um, that is going to help us to continually move in that direction of being a sower, of being um, virtuous, of, of making uh, better decisions and letting go of vices. So um, elevation is, is the ultimate result of taking away all of the negative, the things that destroy our relationships with ourselves, with God and with other people. And when you are a person of elevation, you speak and you conduct yourself in a positive and productive and constructive way. When you're constructive and you build strong relationships with other people, your mentality that's required to execute these actions um, hold the commandments of love. Um, that commandment requires evolution. It's something that takes us from being worldly to ethereal, to being one who does not fight with flesh and blood, but with principalities. It's the true struggle because all the things in the world are a distraction from what is really what needs to be addressed, which is the only thing that we actually have control of ourselves. So um, when we think about the different things, because we are all different, we all have different struggles. Some of us are quick to anger. Some of us have a, a quick mouth. I'm a person who can say very destructive things very easily, takes no effort because I practice that. That we would, that's, you know, sometimes our gifts are not good things. Sometimes our gifts can be destructive things if we don't apply God to them, if we don't choose to exhibit them in the way that God says we should. And the world shows us something that is a destructive path. And we don't say, God, show me why I have this ability. Show me why I have this gift. How do you want me to use this? and use it for good, use it in love, use it in building and constructing strong relationships, helping people build themselves up. All of these things are generalized in a sense of people in general, but these are the things that you see in when you're looking at a potential partner, a potential spouse, you're looking at how they live in the world. Are they of the world or are they independent in their thinking where they are on this other page? Like 
well, everybody else is doing this, but they are holding their standard. They're holding on to their uh, belief of what is right. Do you want the person that's leading the parade of, of partying or do you want the person who is of sober mind? These are the things that you have to ask yourself and consider when I'm looking at my list guide and I'm considering how I know I can recognize this person when I meet them, when I'm getting to know them, what am I looking at? I'm looking at their fruit. I'm looking at that, the choices they make, the things that they're saying, the things, the, the choices that they're making, how their relationships with people are. These things are telling you if they're the, that person. And if that's telling you, then so is the same for you, what your relationships are with people, what you're saying, what your choices are, is telling them the same thing. And prayerfully, the person that has the traits that you believe God says is the right fit for you is going to be a match for yours. And if it isn't, is it because you're not seeking to be where God, you're not being, putting yourself in position? Not just of, oh, I need to be at this place, but position as in where God says you need to be in your relationship with him, in your relationship with yourself and others. There's only you that stands between being who and what God said you should be. That's completely in your control. God gives you the tools. He wants to help you with it. He desires, sometimes he pushes, but you have to make the decision that you're going to make that transition and go from uh, being in the world, on the fence, or fully sold out, fully submitted, fully committed to God's will for your life. And it's not like a destination type thing, like, oh, you know, I, I, I'm done. I'm, I'm, it's a journey. It's a continual choosing every single day, all through the day with God helping you to not curse out that person that, that called on the phone or that employee or that supervisor or that child or that, you know, uh, <laughs> that family member or whomever um, not doing things that you know will be great in the moment, but will be possibly destructive in the long term. Is the more we do things that are uh, good or bad, they become easier because they become habits. So this um, th removing unwholesome talk um, ridding ourselves of negative things, bitterness, rage, uh, profanity, being compassionate, walking in love. Um, these are the things that are the elements of that transformation um, that takes you to a renewed mind and transcends. So the renewed mind this is, in a nutshell, and um, hopefully everybody can clearly see, this is Ephesians and 1 Corinthians, again, living as children of light. So being the fruit of, of God's will in your life, fully submitting to what God said you're supposed to be and working towards that every day. There's never going to be a situation where every single thing you do is going to be perfect and correct. That is the beautiful creation that we are in God. If we were, then it wouldn't, it would actually hurt our relationship with God to be actually perfect without any need for him. Our need for him makes us perfect and seeking him makes us perfect. So that seeking, that desire, and I'm sure we all have met someone that we saw in them that regardless of where they were in their life, their circumstances, 
there was a desire and a seeking to be better, to be greater than where they were. And that's what we have to take on as just a part of life. It's just a choice that we're going to always strive to be better in God. To be better, we have to find out what pleases him. What is the will that God has for you in your life? We, ha- we know that there's a general one that the that scripture speaks about as far as glorifying him and following him and doing these things that we've talked about today. But there's also a specific purpose that you have in what he created you for. Your gifts are perfect for that. Your Even the things that that some people have told you are bad things, are negative things. It's just a matter of knowing how to use them as tools for him because he made all of you. And sometimes, as I said before, the world will teach you to use these things in a negative way, but that doesn't mean that the gift is negative. It just means that you have to learn how to use it the right way. We talk about a hammer. A hammer can be very destructive when you use it on something besides a nail. But it does have a constructive purpose. And part of what God wants is for you to learn the purpose that he put that thing in you for. Don't decide that because you've only used different bad things or for destructive things, that that is a destructive thing. If God put it in you, there's a positive way to use it. And it's up to you to learn go to school. And I don't mean like a brick and mortar. I mean, get, get uh, in the word, get in the position to learn. What am I supposed to do with this? This is what the world says is for, but I believe God that you gave this to me for a, a good reason. And I just need to understand how to use it. And so that being said, don't put time into fruitless deeds or, or, or waste of time, basically. Be careful, be circumspect in the choices that you make in life. Every moment is for a purpose. And it's not to say you can't have downtime or anything, but don't allow it to be so open that anything goes. And do have some time that's purposed of, you know what, I'm just going to take this amount of time every day to work on this thing that God is telling me that I need to work on. Make the most of the time that you have. And when you have situations come up in your life where you are having to deal with things that are outside of your control, which happens all the time, Be at peace in that you know that God is in control, regardless of what chaos is ensuing in that moment. You know that God is in control of it all. And so I've spoken all through this indirect um, statements to you as in everyone who's listening But I just want you to take a step back in this moment and think about everything that was said in the frame of if it was that person that you are believing God for to come into your life. If they did these things, if you saw these things in them, how would you feel? What would you think about this person? And do you not want them to think and feel the same about you? This is well within your grasp. This is a completely achievable to be this person. And I'm not saying that no one has any of these traits. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that, as I've said several times, we're all a work in progress. And sometimes we don't relate these things to a spouse, to a partner. We think about what we want. We think about qualifiers for this other person, but we don't often think about what makes us qualified. We don't often think about, well, does God feel that I'm ready based on what I'm doing, the choices I'm making? 
We just want him to do it. We want him to help us. We want him to to, uh, show grace, forgiveness, love. But we have some control in this. We have a position and a place and a choice to make in what we do in our preparation for what God has for us. So believe and know that God has it, but also don't set aside your part. Do your part and do it in faith to say, I know that God is going to do this. So I need to be ready. Just like we do when we know somebody's coming over. I don't care how clean your house is. If you know somebody's coming over, you're cleaning extra. You're doing extra. You're laying out, you know, if it's going to be a meal or even if they're just coming over and they're not going to eat, you make sure that there's beverages that the glasses are extra clean, you're preparing because you believe it's going to happen. Are you preparing because you believe it's going to happen? And your preparation is all internal. It's all you. And God has told us, he's given us every direction, every tool, every instruction to do that. And on top of that, he's there saying, where does this, where does this pillow go? You want me to uh, fluff out the rugs. What do you, he's helping. He's actively participating and saying, I want you to be ready. I would love for you to be your best self for this awesome person that I'm going to bring into your life. But if you just laying in the bed, like, well, I'll just wait till the doorbell rings. Is that person going to say, um, do I have the right address? Or are they going to say, you're exactly what God told me. You're exactly what he showed me. So in conclusion, I, um, I hope that there was some things that you were able to hear from God on in this. And I know that it's not a finite thing where it all happens in the moment. But I hope that it's giving you some things to think about, to to, uh, meditate on and talk to God about. Um, I want everyone to appreciate not just the promise of what God has placed in all of us, in in the creation of, of us, but also that we as individuals have an awesome gift in each of us to be so much more than we even know. God looks as a, looks at us and he knows that we're so much more than we recognize. But for our will, <laughs> but for our restrictions that we place on ourselves. So be a once in a lifetime kind of woman and know that a good man is everything. <laughs>